The storming of the Bastille, French, Prise de la Bastille, Pise de la Bastige, occurred in Paris, France, on the afternoon of the 14th of July 1789. The medieval fortress, armory, and political prison in Paris known as the Bastille represented royal authority in the center of Paris. The prison contained just seven inmates at the time of its storming, but was seen by the revolutionaries as a symbol of the monarchy's abuses of power. Its fall was the flashpoint of the French Revolution. In France, Le 14 Gilet is a public holiday, usually called Bastille Day in English. <inaudible> <inaudible> Background During the reign of Louis XVI, France faced a major economic crisis, caused in part by the cost of intervening in the American Revolution, and exacerbated by a regressive system of taxation. On 5 May 1789, the Estates General of 1789 convened to deal with this issue, but were held back by archaic protocols and the conservatism of the Second Estate, representing the nobility who made up less than 2% of France's population. On 17 June 1789, the Third Estate, with its representatives drawn from the commoners, reconstituted themselves as the National Assembly, a body whose purpose was the creation of a French constitution. The king initially opposed this development, but was forced to acknowledge the authority of the Assembly, which renamed itself the National Constituent Assembly on 9 July. France was under major changes during this time. The commoners had formed the National Guard, sporting tricolore cockades of blue, white and red, formed by combining the red and blue cockade of Paris and the white cockade of the king. These cockades, and soon simply their color scheme, became the symbol of the Revolution and, later, of France itself, Paris, close to insurrection and, in François Mignet's words, "...intoxicated with liberty and enthusiasm," showed wide support for the Assembly. The press published the Assembly's debates, political debate spread beyond the Assembly itself into the public squares and halls of the capital. The Palais Royal and its grounds became the site of an ongoing meeting. The crowd, on the authority of the meeting at the Palais Royal, broke open the prisons of the Abbey to release some grenadier of the French guards, reportedly imprisoned for refusing to fire on the people. The assembly recommended the imprisoned guardsmen to the clemency of the king, they returned to prison, and received pardon. The rank and file of the regiment, previously considered reliable, now leaned toward the popular cause. Necker's dismissal On the 11th of July 1789, Louis XVI—acting under the influence of the conservative nobles of his Privy Council—dismissed and banished his finance minister, Jacques Necker who had been sympathetic to the Third Estate and completely reconstructed the ministry. The marshals Victor Francois, Duc de Broglie, Le Galissonnière, the Duc de la Vagayen, the Baron Louis de Bretoy, and the Intendant Foulon, took over the posts of Puisager, Armand Marc, Comte de Montmorin, La Luzerne, Saint Priest, and Necker. News of Necker's dismissal reached Paris on the afternoon of Sunday 12 July. The Parisians generally presumed that the dismissal marked the start of a coup by conservative elements. Liberal Parisians were further enraged by the fear that a concentration of royal troops brought in from frontier garrisons to Versailles, Sevres, the Champ de Mars, and Saint Denis would attempt to shut down the National Constituent Assembly, which was meeting in Versailles. Crowds gathered throughout Paris, including more than 10,000 at the Palais Royal. Camille de Molins successfully rallied the crowd by mounting a table, pistol in hand, exclaiming, Citizens, there is no time to lose, the dismissal of Necker is the knell of a Saint Bartholomew for patriots. This very night all the Swiss and German battalions will leave the Champ de Mars to massacre us all, one resource is left, to take arms." The Swiss and German regiments referred to were among the foreign mercenary troops who made up a significant portion of the pre-revolutionary royal army, and were seen as being less likely to be sympathetic to the popular cause than ordinary French soldiers. By early July, approximately half of the 25,000 regular troops in Paris and Versailles were drawn from these foreign regiments. The French regiments included in the concentration appear to have been selected either because of the proximity of their garrisons to Paris or because their colonels were supporters of the reactionary court party, 
Opposed to reform, during the public demonstrations that started on 12 July, the multitude displayed busts of Necker and of Louis Philippe II, Duke of Orléans, then marched from the Palais Royal through the theatre district before continuing westward along the boulevards. The crowd clashed with the Royal German Cavalry Regiment, Royal Allemand, between the Place Vendôme and the Tuileries Palace. From atop the Champs Elysees, the Prince de Lambesque unleashed a cavalry charge that dispersed the remaining protesters at Place Louis XV now Place de la Concorde. The royal commander, Baron de Bassenville, fearing the results of a blood bath amongst the poorly armed crowds or defections among his own men, then withdrew the cavalry towards Sevres. Meanwhile, unrest was growing among the people of Paris who expressed their hostility against state authorities by attacking customs posts blamed for causing increased food and wine prices. The people of Paris started to plunder any place where food, guns and supplies could be hoarded. That night, rumors spread that supplies were being hoarded at saint Lazare, a huge property of the clergy, which functioned as convent, hospital, school and even as a jail. An angry mob broke in and plundered the property, seizing 52 wagons of wheat, which were taken to the public market. That same day multitudes of people plundered many other places including weapon arsenals. The royal troops did nothing to stop the spreading of social chaos in Paris during those days. <laughs> <laughs> Armed conflict The Regiment of Guards Francaises French guards formed the permanent garrison of Paris and, with many local ties, was favorably disposed towards the popular cause. This regiment had remained confined to its barracks during the initial stages of the mid-July disturbances. With Paris becoming the scene of a general riot, Charles Eugène, Prince of Lambesque Marshal of the Camp, proprietor of the Royal Allemand Dragoons, not trusting the regiment to obey his order, posted sixty dragoons to station themselves before its depot in the Chasse d'Anton. The officers of the French guards made ineffectual attempts to rally their men. The rebellious citizenry had now acquired a trained military contingent. As word of this spread, the commanders of the royal forces encamped on the Champ de Mars became doubtful of the dependability of even the foreign regiments. The future citizen king, Louis Philippe, Duc d'Orléans, witnessed these events as a young officer and was of the opinion that the soldiers would have obeyed orders if put to the test. He also commented in retrospect that the officers of the French guards had neglected their responsibilities in the period before the uprising, leaving the regiment too much to the control of its non-commissioned officers. However, the uncertain leadership of Bessenville led to a virtual abdication of royal authority in central Paris. On the morning of 13 July the electors of Paris met and agreed to the recruitment of a «bourgeois militia» of 48,000 men from the 60 voting districts of Paris, to restore order. Storming the Bastille the 14th of July 1789. On the morning of 14 July 1789, the city of Paris was in a state of alarm. The partisans of the Third Estate in France, now under the control of the bourgeois militia of Paris soon to become revolutionary France's National Guard, had earlier stormed the Hôtel des Invalides without meeting significant opposition. Their intention had been to gather the weapons held there 29,000 to 32,000 muskets, but without powder or shot. The commandant at the Invalide had in the previous few days taken the precaution of transferring 250 barrels of gunpowder to the Bastille for safer storage. At this point, the Bastille was nearly empty, housing only seven prisoners, four forgers, two lunatics, and one deviant. Aristocrat, the Comte de Salages the Marquis de Sade had been transferred out ten days earlier, the high cost of maintaining a garrisoned medieval fortress, for what was seen as having a limited purpose, had led to a decision being made shortly before the disturbances began to replace it with an open public space. Amid the tensions of July 1789, the building remained as a symbol of royal tyranny. The regular garrison consisted of 82 invalides veteran soldiers no longer suitable for service in the field, it had however been reinforced on 7 July by 32 grenadier of the Swiss Salis Samade Regiment from the regular troops on the Champ de Mars. The walls mounted 18 8-pound guns and 12 smaller pieces. The governor was Bernard René Delany, son of the previous governor and actually born within the Bastille. 
The official list of Vancouver de la Bastille, conquerors of the Bastille, subsequently compiled has 954 names, and the total of the crowd was probably fewer than 1,000. A breakdown of occupations included in the list indicates that the majority were local artisans, together with some regular army deserters and a few distinctive categories such as 21 wine merchants. The crowd gathered outside around mid-morning, calling for the surrender of the prison, the removal of the cannon, and the release of the arms and gunpowder. Two representatives of the crowd outside were invited into the fortress and negotiations began, and another was admitted around noon with definite demands. The negotiations dragged on while the crowd grew and became impatient. Around 1.30, the crowd surged into the undefended outer courtyard. A small party climbed onto the roof of a building next to the gate to the inner courtyard and broke the chains on the drawbridge, crushing one vanker as it fell. Soldiers of the garrison called to the people to withdraw but in the noise and confusion these shouts were misinterpreted as encouragement to enter. Gunfire began, apparently spontaneously, turning the crowd into a mob. The crowd seems to have felt that they had been intentionally drawn into a trap and the fighting became more violent and intense, while attempts by deputies to organize a ceasefire were ignored by the attackers, the firing continued, and after 3 p.m., the attackers were reinforced by mutinous guards Francaise, along with two cannons. A substantial force of Royal Army troops encamped on the Champ de Mars did not intervene. With the possibility of mutual carnage suddenly apparent, Governor Delaunay ordered a ceasefire at 5 p.m. A letter offering his terms was handed out to the besiegers through a gap in the inner gate. His demands were refused, but Delaunay nonetheless capitulated, as he realized that with limited food stocks and no water supply his troops could not hold out much longer. He accordingly opened the gates to the inner courtyard, and the vankers swept in to liberate the fortress at 5.30. Ninety-eight attackers and one defender had died in the actual fighting, a disparity accounted for by the protection provided to the garrison by the fortress walls. Delaunay was seized and dragged towards the Hotel de Ville in a storm of abuse. Outside the hotel, a discussion as to his fate began. The badly beaten Delaunay shouted, Enough! Let me die! and kicked a pastry cook named Delate in the groin. Delaunay was then stabbed repeatedly and died. An English traveller, Dr. Edward Rigby, reported what he saw. We perceived two bloody heads raised on pikes, which were said to be the heads of the Marquis de Lani, governor of the Bastille, and of Monsieur Flessel's, Private des Marchands. It was a chilling and a horrid sight. Shocked and disgusted at this scene, we retired immediately from the streets. The three officers of the permanent Bastille garrison were also killed by the crowd. Surviving police reports detail their wounds and clothing. Two of the invalid of the garrison were lynched, but all but two of the Swiss regulars of the Salas Samade regiment were protected by the French guards and eventually released to return to their regiment. Their officer, Lieutenant Louis de Flew, wrote a detailed report on the defense of the Bastille, which was incorporated in the logbook of the Salas Samade and has survived. It is perhaps unfairly critical of the dead Marquis de Lani, whom de Flew accuses of weak and indecisive leadership. The blame for the fall of the Bastille would rather appear to lie with the inertia of the commanders of the 5,000 Royal Army troops encamped on the Champ de Mars, who did not act when either the nearby Hôtel des Invalides or the Bastille were attacked. Returning to the Hôtel de Ville, the mob accused the Prévet des Marchands roughly, Mayor Jacques de Flessels of treachery, and he was assassinated en route to an ostensible trial at the Palais Royal. The king first learned of the storming only the next morning through the Duke of La Rochefoucauld. "'Is it a revolt?' asked Louis XVI. The duke replied, "'No sire, it's not a revolt, it's a revolution.' At Versailles, the Assembly remained ignorant of most of the Paris events, but eminently aware that Marshal de Broglie stood on the brink of unleashing a pro-royalist coup to force the Assembly to adopt the order of 23 June and then to dissolve. The Vicomte de Noailles apparently first brought reasonably accurate news of the Paris events to Versailles. M. Gany and Bankel des Essarts, dispatched to the Hôtel de Ville, confirmed his report. By the morning of 15 July, the outcome appeared clear to the king as well, and he and his military commanders backed down. The royal troops concentrated around Paris dispersed to their frontier garrisons. The Marquis de la Fayette took up command of the National Guard at Paris. Jean Sylvain Bailly, leader of the Third Estate and instigator of the Tennis Court Oath, became the city's mayor under a new governmental structure known as the Commune de Paris. 
The king announced that he would recall Necker and return from Versailles to Paris. On 17 July, in Paris, he accepted a tricolor cockade from Bailly and entered the Hotel de Ville to cries of, Long live the king! and Long live the nation! Aftermath Nonetheless, after this violence, nobles, little assured by the apparent and, as it was to prove, temporary reconciliation of king and people, started to flee the country as émigrés. Among the first to leave were the Comte d'Artois the future Charles X of France and his two sons, the Prince de Condé, the Prince de Conti, the Polignac family, and slightly later, Charles Alexander de Callan, the former finance minister. They settled at Turin, where Callan, as agent for the Count d'Artois and the Prince de Condé, began plotting civil war within the kingdom and agitating for a European coalition against France. The news of the successful insurrection at Paris spread throughout France. In accord with principles of popular sovereignty and with complete disregard for claims of royal authority, the people established parallel structures of municipalities for civic government and militias for civic protection. In rural areas, many went beyond this, some burned title deeds and no small number of chateaux, as the Great Fear spread across the countryside during the weeks of 20 July to 5 August, with attacks on wealthy landlords impelled by the belief that the aristocracy was trying to put down the revolution. On the 22nd of July 1789, the populace lynched Joseph Fowlin de Douai and his son in law Louis Benin Francois Bertier de Savigny. Both held official positions under the monarchy. Although there were arguments that the Bastille should be preserved as a monument to liberation or as a depot for the new National Guard, the permanent committee of municipal electors at the Paris Town Hall gave the construction entrepreneur Pierre-François Palloy the commission of disassembling the building. Palloy commenced work immediately. The demolition of the fortress itself, the melting down of its clock portraying chained prisoners, and the breaking up of four statues were all carried out within five months. On 16 July 1789, two days after the storming of the Bastille, John Frederick Sackville, serving as ambassador to France, reported to Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs Francis Osborne, 5th Duke of Leeds. Thus, my lord, the greatest revolution that we know anything of has been effected with, comparatively speaking, if the magnitude of the event is considered the loss of very few lives. From this moment we may consider France as a free country, the king a very limited monarch, and the nobility as reduced to a level with the rest of the nation." In 1790, Lafayette gave the cast iron, one pound and three ounce key to the Bastille to U.S. President George Washington. Washington displayed it prominently at government facilities and events in New York and in Philadelphia until shortly before his retirement in 1797. The key remains on display at Washington's residence of Mount Vernon. Palloy also took bricks from the Bastille and had them carved into replicas of the fortress, which he sold, along with medals allegedly made from the chains of prisoners. Pieces of stone from the structure were sent to every district in France, and some have been located. Various other pieces of the Bastille also survive, including stones used to build the Pont de la Concorde bridge over the Seine, and one of the towers, which was found buried in 1899 and is now at Square Henri Galli in Paris, as well as the clock bells and pulley system, which are now in the Musée d'Art Campanaire. About 900 people who claimed to have stormed the Bastille received certificates Brevet de Vainqueur de la Bastille from the National Assembly in 1790, and a number of these still exist. The building itself is outlined in brick on the location where it once stood, as is the moat in the Paris metro stop below it, where a piece of the foundation is also on display. In popular culture An annual reenactment of the storming of the Bastille was held at the Eastern State Penitentiary in Philadelphia, hosted by the Bearded Ladies a cabaret troupe. Traditionally a Marie Antoinette reenactor declares, let them eat cake, and is promptly beheaded by the mob. The 24-year tradition was ended in 2018. Austrian composer Karl Ditters von Dittersdorf wrote his symphony in C major as a tribute to the event. The first movement of the piece is known as La Prise de la Bastille. In Book Two of Charles Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities, the Defarges help lead the assault on the Bastille. 1789, Les Amants de la Bastille, stage musical whose main characters are split up during the early stages, then reunited during the storming of the Bastille. 
The protagonist of Assassin's Creed Unity, Arno Dorian, is depicted as being one of the prisoners in the Bastille when it gets stormed, and manages to escape in the confusion. Bastille Day was a song written in 1975 by the progressive rock band Rush about the siege, and was included on their album Caress of Steel. <laughs> 